Brunology, the podcast, is brought to you by SS Brewtech, Grape Grain and Bean Homebrew Supply, HomebrewTalk.com, and HomebrewSupply.com. We urge you to go to our website, Brunology.com, and click on the sponsorship page for links to our sponsors. And now, broadcasting from a bar in some random guy's basement, your hosts, Dean Winch and Jason Johnson. Hello, folks, and welcome to Brunology the Podcast, episode 38. I'm your host, Dean Winch. With me today is Jason Johnson, as usual. How's it going, Jason? It's going all right. Yeah? Yeah. Catch you in the middle of something. Looks like you're doing a lot of clicking over there. It said there was an update, and I wanted to close out of it, but, oh, there it is. I can close out of it there. Oh. Oh, boy. Never mind. Keep talking. I'm talking. So, usually I ask you if you have any brewing news to report, but um, in light of that, I'm going to start. Dean, do you have any brewing news to report? Well, yes, actually, I do. Uh, I brewed a, <laughs> I brewed an international dark lager. Um, I don't usually typically make lagers, so I thought, eh, I'll take I'll take a swing at a lager. So I made an international dark lager, actually a Yingling clone. Okay. Um, I don't know how it's going to turn out. It's it's actually done. Uh, it's I used I used ale yeast, but I went real cold with it. Uh, I think I was at like 61. Mock lager? Yeah. So we'll see how that turned out. Uh, I Preliminary numbers were okay. I got down to where I needed to, and I started close enough that I missed. I was supposed to be like 1045. I think it was 1041, something like that. So it was pretty close, but we'll see how that turns out. And then last weekend, I went ahead and made a Yangling Light lager. This time, I actually used lager yeast. So I put... Uh, I took the same recipe and uh, tweaked it down a little bit and made it within the guidelines. And the problem is there's really no yingling is not really very open to letting their specs and stuff out. Sometimes you can go on brewers websites and you can find the information for how, uh, you know, with starting gravity at least or something of a hop indicator or something. Uh, There's really nothing out there for that. So it was kind of a, a fly by the seat of the pants kind of thing. So I took the lager and I just dumbed it down a little bit and took some of the color out of it and kept the same hop choices. And this time I used lager yeast. I used uh, a Mexican lager yeast from our WLP 940. And then I used uh, in the other batch I used um, Cephal or Cephlager 189. Uh-huh. Uh, neither of which I've ever used before. So. They're both um, in the in the fridge doing their thing now, so that'll be another. I'm gonna let those ride out probably a week or two, and then probably two weeks, and then see where they're at. So, which is good because I really don't have any open kegs anyways, so they can sit as long as they need to sit, and it's just fine with me. Sure. I, I, other than that, I don't have anything else to report brewing wise. What do you got? I don't have any brewing news. Uh, Still gearing up for the Advanced All Grain Classic Grape Grain and Bean. Got all my notes finished up for that. I got, um, you know, the, the we put together a slide, slideshow presentation that's going to go along with it to kind of help out. So that kind of took a lot of my a lot of my time. Since we're going to be doing some a water topic, I I really had to focus a lot on what I was going to show for the water, and I really wanted to make sure I got that right because I heard you know some there's going to be some people there that. They're not there to learn. They're there to see what we, we're going to do. We'll see. Awesome. Well, I know I've uh, you've done a couple of classes before, so I'm sure you'll do just fine. Yeah. All right. What do we got for uh, what do we got for style this week? You picked it. Yep. We have uh, category 13B, uh, British Brown Ale. The overall impression is fairly short. Overall impression should be a multi brown, caramel centric British ale. With the roasted flavors of a porter. Ooh. So. Yeah. Um, aroma wise, if you're, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're drinking a British brown ale, aroma wise, you should have a light, sweet malt aroma. Should have a little bit of toffee, somewhat nutty. Uh, might even have some light chocolate notes in it and a light to heavy caramel quality. Um, again, like Jason's mentioned on past shows, not like caramel that you buy from the stores, actual caramel. Yeah. Not. It's got that unique. Not your brocks. Yeah. It's little not, squares. Not sugar. 
Right. Caramel. Yeah. Um, it can have a light but appealing floral or earthy hop aroma to it. Um, a light or fruity, a light fruity aroma may be evident, but it should not dominate. No. The appearance, it should, it should be dark amber. It's, it's got a wide range for appearance. It should be dark amber to a dark reddish brown in color. So, I mean, you're not looking at porter or, or stout, you know, like a black. It's, it's got to be brown, but it's got to be, have, have a substantial browniness to it. <laughs> you know, but I mean, not brown, like black. So something to really pay attention to there. It should be clear. It should have a low to moderate off-white to light tan head. So you're not looking for a big head. You're not looking for big, puffy, pillowy head. It should be, you know, low to medium and uh, white off-white to light tan. Yeah, Flavor-wise, uh, gentle to moderate malt sweetness with a light to heavy caramel character. Again, kind of matches the aroma. Uh, can have a medium to dry finish. The malt may also have a nutty or toasted kind of biscuity, toffee, light chocolate character to it. Again, it's kind of a, a wide range, but it's it's kind of like a mild porter. You're going to pick up a lot of them, different kind of of grain qualities throughout the uh, throughout the flavor on it. You should have a medium to medium low bitterness. Uh, the malt and hop balance uh, it can range from even to to mostly malt focused. But the hop flavor, uh, low to none, flor floral or <clears throat> floral or earthy qualities, uh, low to moderate fruity esters can be present. Mouthfeel, fairly simple. It's going to be medium light to medium bodied. It shouldn't be full. It shouldn't be thin. And medium to medium high, high carbonation. That's all that's listed. So basically, you're also looking for no astringency. The creaminess factor can, can range from, as long as it's pleasant, you know, and it doesn't detract from the beer. And you're not looking for any um, uh, real heavy alcohol warmth or anything. So mouthfeel, medium light to medium body, medium to medium high carbonation, and everything else should just work with the beer and not work against it. Yep. Yeah. It should all Definitely just, no astringency. No, and you want everything to just kind of blend together. Right. You want a nice uniformity on that. It should be pleasurable. Yes. Yep. Yes. It should yep. not be off-putting in any way, shape, or form, whether it be hoppy or too malty or whatever. It should be balanced. Uh just looking at the comments on this, it's a wide-ranging category with different interpretations possible, ranging from, like Jason said, lighter colored uh, to hoppy uh, to deeper, darker, caramel-focused. However, none of the versions have strongly roasted flavors, so that would be a, a ding if it ended up being a little too roasty. A stronger double brown ale was more popular in the past, but it's it's getting pretty hard to find now. And while London brown ales are, are marketed using this the same name of brown ale, um, those can be listed as different judging styles due to the significant difference in balance, uh, mostly especially in the sweetness and the alcohol strength. And, and that doesn't mean that they aren't in the same family. They just should be judged differently. Okay. Um, historically, you're looking at brown ale as, a, as having this long history um, originating in Great Britain. Um, although several different types of the products were used, using that same name at various times, the modern brown ale that we're looking at today, it's, it's a 20th century creation, and it is a bottled product for the most part. Um, it's not um, the same as the, the historical product of the same name. So if you're reading one of those historical books about historical brown ale and you're thinking it doesn't quite match up with what they're talking about or what the BJCP guidelines say, that's the reason why. Um, the BJCP guidelines, you know, they, they uh, accept a, a wide range of, of gravities when brewed, uh, or I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, uh, there was a wide range of gravities that were brewed um, historically, but modern brown ales are generally of the stronger, at least by UK standards, interpretation of that style. Um, I think a lot of those lower ones have probably been pushed down into to English mild, yeah, things like that. Yeah, because that's just a watered-down version, basically. It's a little lighter to drink. Right. Uh, this style uh, that we're talking about is based on the modern, stronger British brown ales. It's uh, not the historical versions or the sweeter London brown ale. Um, it's predominantly, predominantly, but not exclusively, a bottled product currently. You, you're not going to go to a brew pub and maybe find cask uh, versions of this beer too much. Not um, like you used to. Right. Well, you may find some on tap, but... Mostly, you're looking for 
I mean, you're going to find them in bottles according to what this is saying. So, yeah, and if, and if, if you were to. And if you were thinking about making one of these, your characteristic ingredients, you probably, you're going to want to start with a, a British mild ale or a pale ale malt base. Uh, you're going to add some caramel malts to it. You may also have some small amounts of darker malts like chocolate uh, to provide some color and the nutty character. Uh, English hop varieties are probably the most authentic. It doesn't indicate anywhere in the, um, in the profile what hops you typically should use, whether they're American or, or British, but you would think that just based on recipe alone and, and authenticity, you should probably try to find the English hop varieties. And the fact that the guidelines kind of specify you're looking for spicy floral. Yeah. Generally speaking. Generally speaking, that's going to be your, your, your English hops, but. Um, I know with a lot of the, the variants and things that are going out and about right now, that you could probably end up with an American hop that could fill that. Yep. But if you wanted to stay true to it, that's that's what you're going to look for as an English hop. Okay. Uh, comparing this stylistically, we're looking at a more multi-balanced than uh, British bitters, or sometimes you know, you'll call them a, a, a British pale ale. So you're looking for a more multi-balanced than these British bitters. With more malt flavors from the darker grains, um, it should be stronger than a dark mild, although have less roast than an English porter. And it should be stronger and much less sweet than London Brown Ale. So, I mean, you just look at it where it falls in the guidelines. It falls between uh, the 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 mild, and it falls below the um, the English porter in this style. So, or in this category, category thirteen. So, I mean, that is right where it should fall in line in the style comparison. Okay. Um, vital statistics on uh, on this, you're going to um, – it's, it's not real big. Um, you're going to start with an original gravity between uh, 1040 and 1052. Uh, you're going to have between 20 and 30 IBUs. Uh, you're going to have an SRM of, of 12 to 22. You're going to have a finishing gravity somewhere within 1008 to 1013. And that should get you somewhere in the ABV of 4.2 to 5.4. So again, not a real big beer, um, big enough, but not, not huge. So, um, okay. That's what you're going to have for your statistics. Uh, commercial examples, at least what's listed in the guidelines here. These aren't the only examples out there, but these are the main ones that you'd be looking for is a uh, Maxim double Maxim. Uh, Newcastle Brown Ale, that's one of the um, ones that you typically be looking at for this style. Um, Ridge Welter Yorkshire Ale, Ale, Samuel Smith's Nut Brown Ale, and Winchwood Hobgoblin. Sorry, I was taking the drink there. Um, right. Yeah, looking at water suggestions on this, um, going back to brewing water, which is, again, what we use for the... Uh, for the water profile when we talk about this stuff, you're going to use the brown full or the brown multi profile. Uh, otherwise, the London water profile may be good as well. It, it's a multi style, so you want to lean more towards the multi or at minimum balanced profile. And more than likely, you may have to use some acidulated malt or some acid to adjust your pH on this. Um, you're, going, you're not going to want a real high pH on it. And, and you, know, you don't have a lot of dark malts in there, so you're going to want to Probably play with your pH a little bit to get that down where you need to. Um, I would suggest probably somewhere in the, uh, I don't know, five three five four range. I don't think you want to get down to 5.2 on it. Mm -hmm. I would think you'd want to stay a little bit higher, but I wouldn't go higher than 5.4 on it. Okay. I think if you fell into 5.3, 5.3, 5, somewhere in there, you'd probably be better off. Do you have a recipe Sounds for us? Me. I do. I have uh, my Busted Nut Brown. Um, Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> it... Um, it's a beer I've brewed in the past. I brewed it several times, actually, but I haven't brewed it in recent, um, I'd say at least in a year, year and a half or so. Um, so this is uh, my Busted Nut Brown. It's a six and a half gallon recipe. Um, we're going to be assuming 70% brew house efficiency. So if you need to adjust per your equipment, uh, please do so. Um, the estimated uh, starting gravity on this beer is uh, 1045. Uh, roughly 22 IBUs, you're looking at 18 SRM and 4.6 uh, um, ABV. So it is a sessionable beer, it, it, as it should be for the most part. Pushing the limits of the IBUs, though. Yep. You're right yep. at the top. Yep. It is going to use 
Uh, again, remember, this is a six and a half gallon recipe. This is not a five gallon recipe. That's six and a half gallons finished. That's generally what I what I brew. So you like to bottle some, though. I do. I keg I keg five gallons and then I bottle some. So six and a half gallons. It's nine and a half pounds English Maris Otter, half pound of chocolate, half pound of caramel eighty, a half pound of biscuit malt, and a quarter pound of special roast. Uh, use 1.5 ounces of East Kent Goldings, 60 minutes. That is your only um, hop addition. And if you want to, because originally what I did use before EKG was I did use Fuggles. So, Fuggles. Yep. If you like Fuggles, go ahead and toss them in. They're pretty comparable in uh, alpha acids and beta acids. So you can substitute Fuggles if you want. Um, you're not going to get a lot of hop aroma or hop flavor from this. You're doing just one 60-minute uh, hop addition. Uh, your your yeast, you just have to use an English ale yeast. Uh, you can use SO4, uh, Danstar Windsor yeast, WLP200, or Y yeast 1098. Uh, me personally, I'm a fan of dry yeast, so what I use is SO4. When you ferment, you're going to want to ferment between 64 and 68 degrees. Um, that's going to give you, um, depending on, on where you want to fall, the 64 to 68 degrees, you can either be a, a low to moderate fruity character if you desire. You know, the, the less fruity character you want, ferment at 64, even 63, 62 if you want. Uh, if you want a little bit more fruity character, get up into that 68 range. Uh, your mash temperature that you're looking for is going to be 154 degrees, and you're going to mash for 60 minutes or until an iodine test says that your conversion is, is done. Um, I do use London water for this recipe. In the past, what I have used, I've used our local water, and, and I tried to adjust it from there. But uh, what I did do for this presentation is I uh, built it up from distilled, which is what I do currently today. So while I have not brewed with this water, this is what I would brew with if I'm going to brew this recipe again, because I'm going to build the exact same water profile from uh, distilled instead of adjusting my local water. So if you do want to build this water profile from distilled, you are looking at uh, 0.9 grams. This is just for the mash right now. 0.9 grams going into the mash water for, for distilled water of gypsum. Uh, calcium chloride, 0.9 grams. Uh, Epsom salts, 0.4 grams. Uh, 0.5 grams of canning salt. And no baking soda. And 1.2 grams of chalk. That gives you your residual alkalinity that you're looking for. And... Um, I use 3.5 milliliters of phosphoric acid at a 10% strength. For your sparge water, you're going to use 1.5 uh, grams of gypsum and 1.5 grams of calcium chloride, 6 grams of Epsom salt, no um, magnesium chloride, 0.9 grams of canning salt, and then nothing else after that. And you are using higher amounts because there's more sparge water than you're using mash water. Um, for uh, Phosphoric acid is only going to be uh, 0.2 uh, milliliters for that whole thing because you're just looking to keep that pH low. You don't really need any adjustment capabilities there. So it's just 0.2 uh, milliliters for that uh, 6.13 gallons of sparge water. Uh, your mash water should have been 3.52 if I didn't measure that, 3.52 gallons. So that's, again, for a total batch volume of five gallons in the end. 6.5. What did I say? Five. Oh, yeah, 6.5. Yeah. I'm sorry. You start out with 9.5, 9.65 gallons of water, and you end up with six and a half gallon batch. Right. Yep. Yep. That's after grain loss, evaporation. And, of course, you're going to have to adjust to your your equipment. Um, I'm kind of beneficial that my mash tun has zero dead space, so I do get a little bit more from my mash tun than people do if they're using a manifold or, or whatnot, but. But with your new mash tun, you didn't have that when you last made this recipe, did you? That's true. No. So this is not figured in with your new mash tun. This is still figured this, in with your loss. No, this recipe I changed over to my new vessel, oh, to okay. my new my new equipment profile. Okay. And so. and the other the other thing, as long as I've got you on a pause here, back when you were mentioning your yeast choices for this, yeah. you mentioned WLP two hundred. Yes. Your, your notes indicate O two. 200, I believe, is a blend of one oh, and two. Oh, you're right. 200 is my favorite yeast of all time. So, yeah. That's you, best of both worlds. You want to go back and, and correct your yeast choice to WLP002. Yeah, not 200. Well, you could use 200. You could because it's a blend of O1 and O2. Right. Yeah. 
WLP 200 is, is one of my favorite yeast blends of all time. Okay. But so that's probably why that popped into my head. Cause I say 200 a lot. That was a bit Freudian. Yeah. Okay. My bad. We'll let it go. Yep. Extract options. You are going to substitute, uh, the Maris Otter in this recipe and retain all of the other ingredients as they should be. Um, so just substitute the Maris Otter for eight pounds of Maris Otter extract if you can find it, or you're going to look for Brees Pale Ale extract. If you can't find either of those, then golden malt extract will work just fine as well. Again, that's for six and a half gallons. Um, if you're only doing five gallons uh, as an extract beer, uh, you can go ahead and just use 6.66 pounds of extract. That's going to come out almost perfect to that uh, 1040, 1046, 1048, whatever I said. 1048, that I believe. 1045? 1045. I stand corrected. Yep, that comes out pretty much uh, pretty close, at least when I figured it out in Beersmith. Well, and 6.66 pounds of LME also gets you to two full cans. Right, that's why I put that in. Most cans are 3.33. Yep, yep. Two full cans. Um, Reduce your steeping grains to a quarter pound each, though, if you're going for five gallons instead of six and a half. And uh, just reduce the special roast a bit. You don't have to go right down to like an eighth of a pound, but just reduce it from slightly from that quarter pound if you're doing extract. So that's it for the recipe. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us and we'll try to hook you up. Yep. A little bit of help. That goes for any of our recipes too. So yeah. Uh, food pairing wise, I know you like food pairings. I see you uh, have some notes here about food pairing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to read your notes cause I'm not typically that person. So it's okay. Uh, food pairings, uh, roasted white meats, pork, chicken, uh, a thick juicy grilled burger, Grilled steaks, uh, wings, uh, mild spicy to sweet wings. Yep, you don't want super spicy with this no, style. No, that would definitely not go well. Yeah, but mildly spicy, like a, like a low, like just your standard buffalo would work. Yeah. Because buffalo isn't too bad. As long as it's not too tangy. Yeah, just don't get up to your medium and hot. Yeah. Uh, cheese wise, uh, Munster or Gouda are good for dessert. Uh, also choose something like a pecan pie. That's what we got for food pairings. All right. Um, we did have one to review, and like I said earlier, Jason was the one responsible for bringing this. So I think I'm going to kick it off with the aroma for what yep. I got on our sample. Yep. And our sample, again, uh, British Brown Ale 13B. Uh, the aroma for me, I got it as a sweet, toasty aroma. I did pick up hints of toffee. I picked up a low level of dark chocolate. I didn't pick up any hot ar- hop aroma. I didn't pick up any DMS or any diacetyl. No off aromas. Nothing. Nothing off putting. I did kind of think it was a clean profile. Uh, I think it had balanced notes all around. I think it could have used some hop character though, as I didn't get any, and I would have preferred to at least gotten some. So that for me was was a little bit of a ding there. And I did make a note that. Um, as the sample warmed, the toffee came through a lot more and almost made it a little more chewy, okay. um, pleasant, chewy, kind of, not off-putting and, and sticky or kind of cloying or anything. It was, it was, it added to it. it. It helped it out. All right. For me, for aroma, it's, it's, it's funny because we're very close. Um, for aroma, I, I got a light toasty character to it, uh, light caramel. Very light chocolate notes. I did pick up a little bit of hops, um, but that came about for me more as it warmed. And I was having a, I was having a hard time if they were floral or herbal. And I settled on floral, but really I was borderline fence on that. I wasn't sure. I did get a low nuttiness, but what you talked about with the toffee notes that increased for you as it warmed, for me, that nutty character increased as it warmed. Cause at first there was a low nuttiness to it. I went back and, and had sample after I took a second pour, and I got more nuttiness to it. And I fully agree. It's, it's very clean. I didn't get any DMS. I didn't really get any esters. I didn't get any off flavors. It was a very clean pint. Yeah. That's for sure. Yes, it was. What do you got for appearance? Uh, I got uh, It has a, a nice solid clarity to it. The clarity was very good. It wasn't crystal clear, but the clarity was there. It wasn't hazy. A uh, light chestnut brown in color with some garnet hue to it, low tan head, uh, small compact bubbles, and it had low retention. But if you recall back from what we talked about with the style, uh, having a low, a low head and low retention was acceptable for this style. Well, so. 
I, I think it was, if you go back to the notes, I think it indicated something along the lines of uh, low to moderate off-white head, light, off-white to tan head. Um, low to moderate, it doesn't really indicate anything in there as far as lasting, persistence. If you have a low head, it's usually not going to last true, too long. True, true, but... Generally it, speaking. Generally speaking, it doesn't indicate persistence on the on the guidelines. Right. So, um, appearance wise, for me, I can kind of back up what most of you what what most of you said. Some of you didn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Dur, dur, dur. <laughs> um. Okay, going into appearance, um, appearance for me, I can kind of go along with some of the stuff you said. Uh, for me, it was amber to dark copper color. I did have it as crystal clear. I didn't have it as brilliantly clear. It did have a little bit of, I don't want to use haze, but there was something there. So I'm just going to mark it as crystal clear, not brilliant clear. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference to anybody else, but to me, there's a difference. Uh, I thought the head was low. It faded fast, which is again, if it was a low head, that, that's appropriate. I thought it was an ivory color for what it, when it was there. It did have tight bubbles while it lasted, but again, it, it faded really, really fast. Um, if you were sitting around, you might have missed it. It was probably only a good 10, 15 seconds at the most. It really didn't last long at all. Uh, flavor wise, I had it as a, a dry malt profile initially. Um, it kind of it showed signs of some malt sweetness during the sample, and it has a, a toasty and a biscuity flavor with some hints of chocolate to it, balancing um, balancing in there. So it had a, a medium hop bitterness, and and I, I'm putting them down as earthy. I know you had them in the aroma as, as floral, but you were kind of on the fence about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and put them as earthy in the flavor. Uh, it did have dryness and carbonation that left a feeling, a slight feeling of like an alcohol warmth to me. It really was uh, it was a warming in the finish. It wasn't off putting and it wasn't unpleasant. I would just say it wasn't expected, um, and I, I don't know that I don't exactly know how to describe it to the point that it was. It was effervescent, it was dry, but it was something that came across to me more along the lines of alcohol warmth in the overall finish, not in the initial samplings. Okay. So that's what I've got for flavor. All right. For me, I had a whole lot more of the same from the aroma. I had that light toasty caramel, uh, light chocolate, uh, low Low floral hop flavor, uh, low nuttiness, and that also, and like just like the flavor, it increased as it warmed. Uh, the, but um, for me, the balance initially was malty, but um, the bitterness helped balance out that uh, that finish a little bit. It helped to dry it out a little bit, but not as much as what I think uh, from my interpretation of the guidelines. What we're really looking for for this style, the carbonation did help, but um, you know help with that impression of dryness, but not quite enough. The nuttiness was low. It increased as the beer warmed. Um, the Like I said, okay, so we got balance, was leaning towards malty. We got our finish. We've got our yeah, hops, malt. Yeah, they were good to go there. So moving into into mouthfeel, for me it was solidly in the medium body category. It, it sat firmly there. Uh, medium carbonation as well. The carbonation in my mouth was was very evident. It was moderately effervescent. It wasn't prickly, but it was, it was by no means like flat or, or lacking carbonation at all. It had a very nice velvety creamy texture to it, which I thoroughly enjoyed. There was um, no astringency, a very low alcohol warmth, and it did have, um, it did have some spritz to it. Uh, but like I said, I, I do think it was still in that medium range. It wasn't, Going into the medium high or high range, it just, you know, for, for that, the beer of that type of flavor, it wasn't flat at all. It was nice and it had some spritz to it, which helped kind of wash away a little bit, a little bit of that sweetness, which, which I felt was, was there. Okay. Uh, mouthfeel for me, I, I plain and simple. I, I disagree with your statement about medium bodied. I thought it was medium and rather light bodied. 
it, it really didn't have a whole lot of play to it. It was kind of watered down for me. Uh, but I did have it as a medium high carbonation. Um, it was very prickly on the palate. It was very, it, it did a lot of dancing when you were trying to, to discern what it was actually doing. You had a whole lot to, to play with there. So medium high carbonation on that. Um, overall, I thought this was an excellent example of the style. I thought it showed all the characteristics of the style with the exception of the hop aroma and the hop flavor. Um, these both could be bumped up a bit and not be overwhelming. I think there's enough clean British malt character there to it, um, enough toffee, enough caramel notes, uh, enough roastedness to, to balance out a little more hops. Uh, I, I thought the sample was clean, and I thought it was well put together overall. And I did make a note that in the finish, it does drink like a bigger, higher alcohol beer than it should be. So kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier in the flavor about hitting that little bit of alcohol warmth, which may have been the, the carbonation profile or whatever, it, it did come through in the overall for me as well that I thought it was, you know, if it's supposed to be a 4.2 to 5.4 beer, it, it definitely drank bigger than that. Okay. But the body wasn't there to complement it. So... Um, I thought it was an, I thought it was an excellent beer. I, I just think that there was some slight improvements that could be made to help this out a little bit further down the road. Okay. So what'd you get? What'd um, you get? I gave it a 38, but I've got a plus next to it that I could probably be persuaded to go up if I needed to, but not much. Okay. Um, well, I felt the malt, the malt profile was good. It was okay. Uh, for the style. Um, it could use a, a little bit more depth and from all of the, um, the malt flavors, uh, although they were there, I felt they were a little bit muted. I, um, I'd like to see a little bit more smooth, toasty, uh, light roast in the style. Uh, initially it was more sweet than what I'd like to see, but the carbonation did help and the bitterness did help kind of round that out, uh, brought it up, uh, helped dry out the, the, the beer a little bit. Um, really those were the only thing, only issues that I had with it. I ended up giving it a 39. Oh, so we're right there. Yep. Um, so you want to know what the style was? Well, I know what the style was. I mean the beer. It's a British brown ale. I've already gone over that. Yep. Um, it, I don't think it's anything I've had before. If it is, it didn't taste overly familiar from a judging aspect. Um, but if I had to make a guess, I would say it's probably Samuel Smith. Oh, fat squirrel. Here's a here's the thing about this beer. This is a very hard style to find that has not been bastardized, mm. if you want to call it that. Okay. That it does not have it hasn't been oaked. It hasn't been had some sort of nuts added to it. Um, it hasn't had any changes at all to the style. We don't. We have good beer stores in our city here for the most part for the most part we have two stores that have like a wall of beer and they have a big wall of beer yep yeah, and you're looking at anything that's available in our area even if it's a hot seller you can get it you know we can get we can get things you know Man. world worldwide stout any of the stuff that people are seeking out right now we can get them if they're available in our area i mean we can't get that's Cigar the, City. Right. That's the or, catch. Or we can't get Pliny because it's got, it's it's got to be distributed. But if it's distributed in Wisconsin, we can get it. And there was not a single English brown ale that I could find that had nothing done to it. And I know we talked about this in the last episode, mm -hmm. that everything has, has some little twist to it these days. Fat Squirrel, and, and I apologize to the listeners because it's only available in Wisconsin, but it is a commercial beer. And if you're a beer trader and you want to try it, hook up with somebody online and trade trade with them. And the funny thing about this beer, and our club is taking a trip to New Glarus in December, is yep. it? Go have New Glarus at the brewery. It is the absolute best nut brown beer that I've ever had in my life at the brewery. And every time I have it in the bottle, nowhere near how I've had it 
at New Glarus because at New Glarus, you go into their gift shop and you can say, I want, give me a pint of that. And it's, it's right there and you know, it's, no, it's fresh. So Came right off the line, the keg is sitting right there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, it was, it was the best fat squirrel I've ever had and no fat squirrel has ever come close to it. So it's going to be the, literally the first beer I have when we go on our club trip. It, and I have a beer after our little tastings that we do. Mm-hmm. But when we go down to the shop, I'm going to get a pint of fat squirrel because nothing competes with it. Well, and I have to apologize because, like I said before, you told me what this was. I indicated that may I didn't recognize it, and I may not have had it. And I've I've, driven, I've drank gallons of this stuff already. Mm-hmm. And it didn't come across. I, I you haven't had it blind though. No, I haven't had it blind, which proves the theory of what we were trying to do with this in the first place to a certain degree. Right. Um, our scores are still close enough that yep. that we're not we're not getting to that aspect of what we were hoping to get to, but. Um. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, I I've always known that Fat Squirrel was a good beer. I've always liked Fat Squirrel. Um, and I think my score indicates that, but I, I do stand by my statement that it could have used a little bit more hops. See, and on, on the flip side of that, I wanted to score it lower because I know it can be better. But I'm looking at the guidelines, but you're, and I'm going. I there's really nothing in my score that I can. It's clean. Yep. It's lightly nutty. I mean, the hops aren't too high. They're not too low. For me, the carbonation wasn't too bad. The body wasn't bad. Flavors were all there. It just, it blew me away when I had it at the brewery. I'm like, it's an average nut brown. But see, you can't do that. You can't. No, you can't. No. Because you have to judge it for the sample you have in front of you. Well, that's what I did. So, but for you to say that you almost treated it to a higher standard, no, I would have treated this to a lower standard. Well, right, because of what you experienced. Because I know it can be better. Well, that's yeah. fine, but that's that's a moot point during this during this endeavor. So, right, it's it's nice to see you could hold your ground on that one. Yeah, as restrained as it seems to have made you. Well, thirty nine, it's excellent beer. Yeah. So, where when I'm drinking it, when I know what it is, I think it's a very good beer. Agreed. All right. So we are going to be looking at a fairly big topic now. We got a long show. Well, we've got time. Let's get if we try to stick to the hour, we right. got over I'm, 15 minutes. I'm left. going to stop interrupting. Go. Well, you're going <laughs> to you're going to do some of this too. All right, segment 2. Yeah. Well, segment 2. This is a, a this is a great topic. Um this topic came from us from a Doug Piper, this is I love listener suggested topics. Yeah, and I I've, really do. And I've actually, a side note, I've actually been in communication with Doug via email for probably the last week or so. Okay, and Doug seems to be a, a pretty great guy from what I've gathered through his emails. Mm-hmm. Not afraid to ask questions, takes advice and, and stuff for for what it is, and um, I, I really like communicating with him. So I'm I'm looking forward to this. Yep. Well, he requested because he was he's actually going to be taking the exam at the end of January. So I don't know if we're going to get this show out before. It, it, it might be tight, but um, I, I don't know. It may not do him any good. He's taking the exams at the end of January. Um, he was having an issue with mouthfeel. Um, you know, mouthfeel is it's, it's one of those attributes. It's very difficult to explain, in my opinion. How, how do you teach somebody what somebody or how do you teach someone what something feels like verbally? I mean, try it. I mean, imagine, imagine we went through our whole life without ever experiencing getting cut. How would you explain to that person what a paper cut feels like? Or, or, you know, what would you say? Would you say it hurts? I mean, lots of things hurt, but they feel differently. They hurt in a different way. A bonk in the head um, hurts, yet the pain is completely different from a paper cut. So how do you describe to to somebody what something feels like who maybe has never really had a chance to evaluate you know, maybe how that liquid feels in your mouth. That's why I, that's why I feel mouth feel is, is difficult to explain. Flavors, you can, you can correlate. Like most people have had marshmallow or they've had something sweet. Yeah. Feeling is how do you know if somebody's felt something before? That's a good point. So, um, but back to your point about experiencing a cut. Do you consider in your, in your aspect of example, do you consider scratches cuts or are they two different things? To me, a cut is an abrasion. It's not a cut. Okay. But. Again, a, a, a scratch could be an to, abrasion. But to you, maybe you define a, a cut as a scrape. 
So oh. there's a, there's another, there's another, it's a feeling. It's a right. different type of feeling. I'm, I'm just, I'm just playing devil's advocate here saying that, okay, if you're looking at somebody who's never experienced a cut, how do you explain them what a paper cut feels like? Well, if they've ever had a cat scratch, that's kind of what a paper cut feels like. That would Not be to it. me. That would be it. Well, they could, uh, a that cat would, scratch kind of, it, maybe everybody's different, but a cat scratch to me, a scratch burns more than it stings. Where a paper cut to me is kind of like that clean stinging feeling. Okay, see, that's where we're different because a paper cut doesn't sting. It stings to me. A paper cut is, well. And, and that's, that right. might be proving the point that we're talking about here. Right. And that all depends, again, upon location, I think, as well. You get a paper cut and a webbing of your fingers. <laughs> that's going to hurt and sting a lot more than getting a paper cut on the tip of your finger. I suppose. Yeah, that's true. It's and, more sensitive. And a cat yeah. scratch somewhere on the palm of your hand. Versus your versus, undercarriage. Well, okay. If you want to go there. Um, I was thinking more like your forearm or something. Sure. Um, is obviously going to feel different. So, well, that, that's what we're going to, we're going to try and give people the tools. We're going to do the best we can. All right. To give them the tools that they can make their, make their own correlation based on what a general consensus thinks of. You can already things. see where this road is going. So absolutely. If you want to stick around for the ride, put your seatbelt on because here we go. Yep. This is going to be fun. We're going to start with body. Body is the main. Love a good body portion of mouthfeel. <laughs> um, so I, this is something, it was kind of an interesting journey when, when Doug suggested this topic because I thought about light, medium and full bodied and, and I, and everything in between. And how can a person at home start to grasp the textural differences between light to full body without doing so with, with a carbonated beer and without going to extremes of different types of liquids? You know, like if we're talking, we're saying water is very light bodied and syrup is full bodied. How do you, you know, there, you're never going to have a, you're never going to have a beer that is as thick as maple syrup. You, if you do, somebody did it wrong and well, they didn't yeah, it. But it will, <laughs> you just won't. I mean, because I've never even had wort that was as literally as thick as maple syrup. All right. You know, or, or, or malt extract or something. I'm doing a quadruple decant next time and I'm going to bring you the sample. I would love it. <laughs> but, um, you know, then it hit me. I, I was thinking milk. Milk could potentially be a great asset. Skim milk is is very low in milk fat and also has the mouth and very light bodied feel you you when compared to something like whole milk and then you also have other other uh concentrations of milk fat in there you have 1% 2% that are in between heck you can even go up to half and half to prove to prove your point or even whipping cream if you really wanted to go that far Ugh. but the viscosity and the feel of milk inside of your mouth between skim milk and half and half is roughly according to my personal interpretation about the same as going um, light bodied to medium light to medium to medium full to full. So your light bodied would be skim milk. Your medium light would be about 1% milk. Medium body, 2%. Medium full to full would be whole milk. And chewy would be your, your half and half. So the funny thing is, is I had that, I had that epiphany on my own. Bravo for you. But I started. I, I thought, okay, well, I want to see if there's something else out there that's a little easier to talk about. Oh, here, I thought you were going to tell me you went milk shopping. Nope. Okay. Nope. So I thought, I'm going to see, okay, this is what I'm thinking, but I'm going to see if there's something out there that, that, that's a little easier, or maybe, maybe I'm off the mark. So I found a source then that actually compared milk <laughs> directly to uh, a one to one comparison for mouthfeel. Uh, for a gauge, and it was, um, I don't remember the source, unfortunately, I, I don't remember that, so I apologize, but it was a secondary source that used milk as well as a body comparison for, for beer. So you're not a trendsetter. I'm not a trendsetter, yeah. but I, I do have to say I was proud of myself that. For that little moment? I came up with it, and then yeah, I matched up with somebody else. So, right. uh, very thin body, according to, to this, yep, to this resource. Very thin bodied would be the equivalent of water. Uh, thin bodied would be between water and skim milk. Uh, skim milk is equal, according to this other source, as medium bodied. And full bodied would be equal to whole milk. And very full and chewy would be equal to light cream or half and half. So whatever scale you choose to use, whether it be this, um, the water, skim milk to full milk, um, scale, or if you you use my scale as light 
Uh, skim milk, medium light, 1%, medium, 2%, medium full to full would be whole and chewy half and half. Whatever scale you choose to use, the correlation is very close uh, to giving you that impression of what you want to feel in your mouth when you're looking at the body of the mouth feel. I mean, you're going to compare, even if you compare water to skim milk or you compare skim milk to whole milk and you think whole milk is full, skim milk is light, you're going to feel, and we're not talking how it tastes. Ignore how it tastes. You have to. We're talking about how it feels in your mouth, the viscosity, how thick or or cloying. Yeah, how it how it feels in your mouth. Because mouth feel is exactly what it's talking about. It sounds about. like such a dirty topic. It is. But mouth feel is exactly what it's talking about. It is the feel. It has nothing to do with flavor. It has nothing to do with aroma. It has nothing to do with how it looks. It's all how you feel in your mouth. So with that done, we'll move into carbonation. Carbonation is the next most important thing or, or the most um, most obvious topic we're going to talk about with mouth feel. So the body isn't the only sensation that we're talking about. Body alone isn't mouth feel. You're also thinking about carbonation. It's basically any physical sensation you get in the mouth. So carbonation, it is a physical sensation. Even if carbonation is one of those components that can affect appearance, it can affect flavor, it can, and it can affect aroma. So for example, if you have a flat or still beer, um, that flat or still beer will still have very little aroma because the carbonation that pushes that aroma out isn't going to be present to push that aroma forward out into your nose. Um, same with flavor. In high amounts, uh, carbonation can add acidity. You know, you have that carbonic bite. Yep. But we're not talking about flavor. So in proper amounts, the carbonation will, uh, well, going back into flavor, the carbonation will help scrub out the palate of flavors in the mouth, preparing you for another drink. If the beer is flat, it could leave a lingering sweetness that if the beer was carbonated, you may not otherwise perceive. Coying. Yep. So you really need to enjoy, or enjoy, ignore the flavor aspects that the carbonation brings to the table. We're focusing strictly on how it feels in your mouth. In that regard, we're talking about the bubbliness of the beer or the fizziness of the beer. So some examples for gauging your own personal comparison for carbonation is uh, looking at beer styles. Your beers that are typically going to be high in carbonation are going to be your German wheat beers. A really good one would be, you know, your Hackershaw Weiss. Yeah, very bubbly. Uh, your Belgian strong ales, the ones that come with the big old corked top, usually tend to be a little more highly carbonated. And many sours. And the reason is because the Britannomyces and, and the bugs and stuff that are in a sour tend to continue to ferment in the bottle and you'll end up with a, a higher carbonation in most cases. So if you're looking for high carbonation, grab your German wheats, your Belgian strongs, and your sours. Medium high carbonation, most lagers, you know, you're looking at your American light lager, your Budweiser, your Coors, those tend to be medium high in carbonation, as well as cream ale. Go grab yourself some Genesee cream ale, or, um, well, you're not going to get it if you're out of Wisconsin, but our, our fat squirrel that we, or not fat squirrel, um, oh God. Spotted cow. Spotted cow, yeah. You're welcome. Um. You know, Genesee Cream Ale, if I haven't talked about it, or your Kolsch. Your Kolsch beers, for the most part, are going to be medium-high in carbonation. Medium carbonation, you're looking at Czech Pilsners, your Doppelbox, your Belgian Pale Ale, not your Belgian Strongs, your Belgian Pale Ales. Uh, Vit beer, like, um, say, like a, a Hogarden, something like that, tend to be medium in carbonation for the most part. I just had one of those the other day. It was delicious. Sweet Stouts. Uh, not dry stouts, not dry Irish stouts. You're looking at your sweet stouts, like uh, Left Hand Brewing Company's Milk Stout. Um, or most of your IPAs fall in the medium category, for generally speaking. Uh, Medium-low carbonation levels are going to be your robust porters. Most of your English pale ales, not your American pale ales. These are the English varieties. Or if you can, um, oh, no, we're not going to go to cask. Cask is low. So most of your bottle-conditioned English pale ales your barley wines, your stouts, be it your dry English or your dry Irish stouts, Scottish ales, those tend to be in your medium-low range 
start sampling some of those, get a good feel for where a majority of those beers fall into play, you get a good idea of where medium low comes in. Well, and again, that's carbonation level. That's not mouthfeel. So you could look at something like a medium low. Yeah, we're talking just carbonation right, right now. Right, yep. right. But, but I, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to get ahead of you here a little bit, but you're talking about medium low carbonation level on a barley wine. You are still going to get that full bodied. Right. Yeah. Mouthfeel. Yeah. So carbonation, mouthfeel, two different things. But when it comes to a sample like a barley wine on a medium low carbonation level, you still are going to get that chewiness and that, that full bodied mouthfeel. Yep. Yep. And most, most of the reason that this example is listed in the medium low category is it may start at medium and most of them are well aged. Yeah. It loses. And it, it is going to slowly lose a little bit, even in a, even a cap bottle. So, but even still, you're still going to get that, that full mouthfeel on it. You, you are going to get the full mouthfeel. Definitely. Yep. 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 Low carbonation are going to be most of your cask conditioned ales. You shouldn't really see a whole lot of CO2, um, you're a whole lot of CO2 condition beers falling into that low category. If they do fall into the low carbonation range, they're almost flat, but they got a little bit of fizz to them. That's not going to be what you're looking for. But if it's a cask conditioned beer, you're at a, you're at a brew pub and they got a beer engine and they're, they're, they're serving something off cask. Don't expect it to be anywhere near the medium to high. It is going to generally be low. Um, I also consider low to be your nitro beers, even though that's not carbonation. It's that same feel. It does have a little bit of fizz to it. It has some gas texture to it, but because it, it's not flat, right. it's not still, uh, but it's definitely not in the medium low to medium range. So uh, a good good way to look at that would be your nitro beers as well. Although, like I said, it's not CO2. And then still, you shouldn't really have any still beers unless you're judging the Lambic category, because Lambics are the only beer that I'm aware of that can be served still. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking meads, because meads and ciders can be still. But if we're talking strictly beer, the only beer style that I'm aware of are still Lambics. And Lambics can be still when it's just a Lambic. When they start blending, they start making a goose, then you're What's looking that? at then you're looking at the high carbonation. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. Effervescent on a goza. Yeah. Not goza. Goose. Goose? G U E U Z E. Oh. Goose. Not G O S E. Okay. Yep. My bad. It's okay. Not a sour beer guy. My bad. <laughs> So, high carbonation gives the impression of a lighter body than the beer actually has. No hate mail. No hate mail. What? Jason. Oh, we're on the last topic. Yeah. Jason, oh. Jason at Burnology.com. <laughs> so, just to break it down a little bit more, high carbonation can give the impression of a lighter body than the beer actually is because of that effervescent, prickly fizziness to it. So, if you have a beer that's too highly carbonated for the style and the body appears to be light, that could be a potential correction to talk about. Is, you know, like you're, you're, you're doing one of those fuller body beers. Say it's a, say it's a, a, an American barley wine and it's, it's very effervescent, very fizzy. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like it has that full bodiness to it. Medium body. Yeah. So look at that. You know, that's a potential correction is that the, the, um, carbonation might be too high for, for the style. Carbonation levels can also enhance the alcohol warmth due to the reaction that the CO2 has. On the nerves of the mouth, so you you're basically competing between the alcohol warmth and say some carbonic bite. So something to really pay attention to with those those um, carbonation levels. In the mouth, in the mouth feel, you should maybe list carbonation levels, um, uh, be it what you perceive as as high, medium, low, but also the the type of impression you get. You know, was it fizzy, effervescent, prickly, smooth, poppy? Whatever adjective you want to use to describe that mouthfeel, as far as the carbonation level goes, that will work. I mean, you're not going to have a still beer, but yet call it effervescent. But I mean, if it's very, you know, like a medium body beer and it's got a lot of bubbles rising from it, it's still fizzy, but it's not, doesn't have that bite. And, you know, when you pour it into your mouth, it doesn't foam up and create a lot of foam. You know, it might be effervescent, might be a little prickly. It might have a little pop to it, but it's not really fizzy, effervescent, so... Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Okay. But I, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm just trying to think of ways 
on your notes to try and help out listeners, but I think you've got most of the cover because I don't know what adjectives you would use to describe that besides what you listed. Yeah, fizzy, effervescent, prickly, smooth, poppy. Yeah, I can think of a couple of cocky terms and things that don't make any <laughs> sense to anybody, but I'm not going to throw them in there. So, sure. whatever. All right. Moving into astringency. Moving on. Astringency is another one that's listed under the mouth feel that, that we need to talk about. And this one is tough for most people because it, it really it really is. It is for me too. Um, it, it, it Astringency tends to become uh, one of those things that people tend to blame – uh, for flavors that a person doesn't really know how to describe. But astringency, it's a feeling you get of drying, a, a puckering, or a powdery or harsh bitterness caused, caused by polyphenols that we commonly know as tannins. These tannins have a physical effect on the cells inside of your mouth that actually does literally dry them out. So that drying sensation that you get is actually really a drying sensation. These tannins um, also tend to coagulate the proteins in your saliva, which is why um, your spit, I mean, we're going to get kind of a little bit on the gross side here, but your spit can become a little thick instead of watery if in, in, a, in a beer or a wine that's highly tannic. Um, I should you know, probably note that astringency is almost always a product of some sort of mishandling of a plant component in the beer. Doesn't mean you beat up your hops, but maybe you left your hops in a little too long. You dry hopped with too many hops for too long. You abused your grains, be it you over crushed them, you got them too hot, or whatever. So it's usually uh, astringency, usually is not a water issue. It's not a fermentation issue. It's almost always has to do with the, with the plant itself. So some, some common causes of astringency are the extraction of tannins. From your grain by a combination of high pH and heat during your sparge, but can also be extracted during the mash, during the mash out, I should say, if your pH is above six or so. So, so tannins, like I just mentioned, they're a natural byproduct of of the grain, and um, they're also tend to be more prevalent in your dark roasted grains. Uh, that's that's due to the the actual roasting and the and the burning process that goes on in those roasted grains. So overuse of chocolate malt or any dark roasted grain, be it roasted barley or whatnot, the overuse of those can lead to a roasted grain astringency, which usually, at least for me personally, comes across as that the powdery drying sensation. Although I know I have liquid in my mouth, it almost feels like I'm trying to swallow. It, it, in high amounts, it feels like I'm trying to swallow like baby powder, mm -hmm. like that type of feeling. Yep. So... um the third most common form of forms of talent or um, the third most common form of tannins is coming from your hops. Like I just mentioned a minute ago, it's either the overuse of hops or the extended dry hopping. Uh, and that leads to what many people call uh hop astringency. For me, when I get hop astringency, it comes across almost like a tea. Like I'm drinking tea because tea always has that astringent um, characteristic to it. I'm not a big tea drinker. No, no. So that's for me, uh, that's how I distinguish, distinguish between, uh, the grain astringency that you get with roasted grains and hop astringency is they, they do for me come across differently. One is more powdery. The other is like a, a puckering, like a sucking tea bag type of astringency. Yeah. I, I guess I can kind of see where you're going with that. I mean, as far as tannins go and, and stuff. And astringency overall, for me, from, from past experience, I would say most of my astringencies came from my water. I'm not going to go and say they came from my malts or my hops or my overuse of hops. But tannins cannot come from your water. Well, from the pH part. Oh, from the pH part. Yeah, because from before, before I start, when yeah, I first started brewing, I didn't adjust my water. I just went on the adage that if the water was good enough to drink, it's good enough to brew with. And, and I've learned a lot since then. So you were extracting tannins from your grains, you're saying? Well, based on the pH, correct. Okay. So, because tannins and astringency are strictly a plant based fault. Correct. Be it hops or grain. Correct. That's where they're going to come from. Or, or wild yeast. I mean, it, it can come from wild yeast as well. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to say I did or didn't, but I don't think I had that problem. I, I think most of it was from the, from the pH levels with the way that the, the grains were interacting with everything else. Um, I've never, I mean, I didn't dry hop until two months ago. So 
for me, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that most of my astringencies in my previous brewings came from dry hopping or from hop, ma- hop matter. I think they probably came from extracting the tannins from the grains when it comes to the pH level of the water before I adjusted. Okay. So that makes sense. I guess that's what I was trying to get at. In almost all beers, astringency is a kind of fault. I mean, uh, there are very few select beers where light grain astringency or hop astringency is allowed. I think off the top of my head, I mean, we're talking Flanders red. There's a little bit of hop astringency or um, grain astringency that's allowed. And your imperial IPAs, you, you can get away with light hop astringency, but I mean, we're not talking anything that should be high in, by any means, by any means. Even in those. Right. Okay. So while we're sticking on tannins, I do want to talk a little bit about wine because I know what you're thinking. You know, tannins, they're a key point of wine. So why are they a fault in beer? If you remember from a, a little bit ago, I talked about um, how the tannins coagulate the proteins in the saliva. Uh, that same reaction that, um, that we're talking about here is uh, what will give body to the wine, which, which wine is normally a very thin and dry beverage. So what, what you'll notice is when it comes to wine, the sweeter the wine is, usually the less tannic the, the wine should be. Uh, you're looking at, you know, your, 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 your deep, dark, very dry reds tend to have more tannins to them than, say, a, a, a Riesling or yes. something along those lines. So that's just some food for thought. If you're thinking, well, why are tannins so desired in wine, but they're considered a fault in beer is because beer does not need that sort of help to build the body of the beverage. Wine does. Like if, if you had a wine that had zero tannins in it, it would, it would be extremely thin. And that, those tannins in that, in those, um, in that wine coagulates proteins of your saliva and helps give that impression of, of some body to it. So it doesn't feel like you're drinking water when you're drinking wine. So that I just wanted to differentiate between that. So we've only got a couple of quick other topics to talk about. Creaminess. Creaminess is another one that's required on your score sheet. So creaminess, we can go back to our milk analogy. So completely forget about the viscosity of the milk or how the milk feels inside of your mouth. But think about how, how full and thick that the, the milk fat is on your tongue or inside of your mouth. It gives you that impression of a, of creaminess to it. You know, you compare skim milk to say half and half. It's going to have a lot more of a creamy, smooth, rich texture to it than say that, that, uh, that skim milk will. So I think of creaminess as how smooth and velvety the beer may feel. Maybe the beer leaves a slightly creamy like coating in the mouth. Carbonation levels can have a lot to do with the perception of creaminess as the carbonation can kind of scrub some of that out. But think of the smooth, velvety feel of a good nitro stout compared to the sharper edges of a CO2-based stout. That is a nice definition, in, in, in my opinion, of defining that creaminess, that a nitro beer is tends to be, at least from my experience, more creamy yep. than a CO2 carbonated uh, stout. Absolutely. I've already gone so far as to have a sample that I would regularly have either out of a bottle or on draft at some place and then find someplace else that has that same beer on nitro. And it's literally like drinking two different beers. Yep. It, it's night and day. It, it's absolutely amazing what nitro can do to a beer. Now, now, granted, not all beers should get that treatment. There are some beers that should not be nitro. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot, a lot of beers that really benefit from that. Yep. And, and, uh, and most most notably your darker beers and, and, and such. But, um, yeah, it's just amazing. Those, those fine bubbles and that just creamy smoothness is just almost amazing when it comes to – you're not drinking a beer. You're, like, drinking a dessert. Yeah. Yep. It's almost what it's like. Yep. And, I, li- and I'm not a dessert guy. So. <laughs> That's true. Like you said, those finer bubbles, they, they lend them a more smooth edged and feel rather than the sharper contrasting edge of a standard uh, carbonated beer. That nitro isn't just about the cool cascading effect. Uh, everybody likes the cool cascading effect when they get a nitro beer. Yep. But it, like, like you mentioned, it completely changes the texture of the beer. And it's usually what we're talking about 
when we're talking about creaminess. Yep. Moving into alcohol warmth. Alcohol warmth is something else we need to talk about in mouthfeel. Ideally, we don't want to hear or we don't want the beer to be so high in alcohol that it feels hot or prickly like a shot of vodka. You know, vodka doesn't have flavor, but it does have some alcohol warmth to it. But um, basically what you want is to talk about any detection of alcohol warmth that you may get. You may um, – the beer shouldn't be warm like a booze unless you're unless you're doing a, a big beer, you know, be it a, a big 10 plus yeah. percent beer. Well, but, even then you still shouldn't get booze from it. You should get fusels, but you shouldn't get booze. Well, that's true. You should really – I mean, if you're, if you're getting booze from a beer, that's a big, 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 big beer. Well, or it's bourbon barrel aged or – it's, you know, it's got something in it. Yeah. Um, so like some high AB, ABV beers maybe, but um, generally speaking, you should detect very low levels of a warming se- sensation, very low levels in most moderate to high alcohol beers, say around 5% or so. Most people can start to tell you're drinking something that has alcohol in it. You may not be able to tell what it is, but have you ever drank something and went, I think this has alcohol in it, but you're not. You know, maybe it's not a big, you know, say, say, um, holidays time and you have a, a punch in it and maybe this punch. Somebody spiked the punch. Right. But I mean, that's not, we're not talking a big old, like we're dumping bottles upon bottles. And this ain't a college party. Right. Okay. But you're like, it's got some alcohol in it. You should start to be able to, to detect that somewhere around 5% or so. That's where most people can start to tell that something has alcohol in it. It's usually not in the flavor. Usually not in the aroma, but for most palates, you can generally taste the alcohol at that level. Um, once you start getting into six, seven percent or more, you're going to start getting more of that warming sensation to it. But either way, your ranges here will be from no alcohol warmth detected through a harsh solvent burning sensation. Most beers, though, should have a mild, almost undetectable warming sensation or no sensation at all. If you're getting anything hot, or solventy, that's definitely a fault. Yep. Um, well, and it's like I said earlier when we were judging the uh, the style of the episode tonight, is I had thought maybe there was a little bit of alcohol warming, but I wasn't sure if it was the carbonation combination of the the carbonation or or the the roasted malts or what that was. I think fat squirrel is about five eight, so it's a little big for style. Well, and I was going to say five four is the top of the scale, and if you're saying at five, you can detect it. I, I yeah. Yep. There was a little something there. Yep. Uh, finishing up this topic, where we have to talk about other mouth sensations. So for other, we're talking about any other physical sensations. For example, if the beer has diacetyl. Diacetyl tends to leave a slickness on the tongue. Uh, many people mention that there's a slickness in flavor. So when you think about it, that slickness or that oiliness is a tactile sensation. If it's a tactile sensation, something that you feel then it should be mentioned in mouthfeel. Some other examples would be oily, say uh, from an oatmeal stout. Some uh, high use of oats can give you oily impression. Metallic, um, which I'm not talking about the taste, not a metallic taste of copper, um, which is a flavor component, but maybe it slightly gives you that feeling of chewing on aluminum foil, and that has happened to me once. I drank a beer that felt like I took a bite of aluminum foil. So um, that's what we're talking about with metallic. Uh, suspended yeast. You can feel suspended yeast in there. It's got that grittiness to yep, it. Like sand. Yep. So that, if you can feel it, if it's got a grittiness to it, that would be an example of an other sensation that you would want to talk about. So many other components um, I've read, you know, maybe they're variations of astringency. They may be powdery, nerve pain, dry oxidation, etc. Those would all fall under other. So basically anything that doesn't fall under alcohol warmth, creaminess, astringency, carbonation or body is going to fall under your other category. And I just want to stress out that remember mouthfeel is anything that has to do with tactile sensation in your mouth. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be talking about anything that's listed under the flavor components, anything that's listed under aroma or appearance, anything that's listed under, under um, mouthfeel should fall under there. Yep. Yeah. Stick to that. They give you those nice little notations at the top of each category as far as what you should be getting. Right. And and we've talked about that in the past when it comes to filling out a, a scoring sheet that 
what they have listed there, you should at least make notations based on each one of those that you should have something there for that. If you don't get it, then say you don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you get no astringency, astringency is listed as something you need to talk about under your mouthfeel. Yep. If you get no astringency, say no astringency yep. and make, be done with it. Make a note of it. Yep. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to try and find it. You don't have to make a special little notation and a paragraph about it, about why you didn't find it or what you think could have not been. Just no stringency. Right. We'll move on. Yep. Um, but I, I think these are all very good notes, and I think there's a lot here to, to <laughs> absorb and a lot to digest. But if somebody is, is looking at the aspect of of getting this, I, I really think that this is a, a good way to get there. And I see we're really way over on time. So I apologize for that to everybody. Yeah. But, uh, we, we really wanted to hit this home and get this out there. So, um, I'm, I'm not going to add a lot more to it. Nope. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. Prost. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Boom.